It's Comics Great Visual Storytelling Show, recorded live every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely, lovely downtown Ann Arbor on the corner of 5th and William. And uh, this is the show where we talk with a bunch of cartoonists about a whole lot of different things, about making comics, publishing comics, distributing comics, uh, nerdy philosophy about comics. And uh, my name is Jersey Drost, cartoonist and teaching artist from Ann Arbor, and uh, I am so excited about this episode. This is, this is a bit of a dream episode for me, because I got two of my favorite authors in the, well, in the room, so to speak. In the room with me is Jim Ottaviani. Did I do it right? All right, thank you. Uh, of gt-labs.com. Uh, you've written so many books, and I got some of them right here. Let's see. We've got Levitation, Physics and Physiology in the Service of Deception, which is, what's this one? This one is about... Uh, it's mostly about stage magic. Yeah. And uh, a turn-of-the-century illusion that I got obsessed with. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but uh, I guess if you spend a whole year working on something, that qualifies at least as a minor obsession. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and... So here we can show some of the art on the inside, and let's see who did the art. Janine Johnston. Yes. Okay, and then you also have Bone Sharps, Cowboys, and Thunder Lizards, which is about uh, scientists chasing and competing over bones. That's yes. right. Uh, the fossil wars of the Old West. <laughs> These are two of the first paleontologists ever. And then it was a cutthroat business for a while there. Uh, they were not good people, <laughs> uh, for the most part. They they were scoundrels. That's why we had to include an artist in there to to get someone to like. And then we've got the big one. This is the one you've been traveling all over the place talking about lately. Uh, your newest book that just came out, uh, Feynman, the biography of Richard Feynman, famous physicist. Yes. And also suspended in language, the story of Niels Bohr. So you do a lot of books about science. I do. And, and biography and history. And then also, and I'll do it, we're going to go into like uh, fully introducing you guys to the public, but I just want to get all the introductions through. Uh, on the Skype, we've got somebody who I'm very excited to talk to, Nick Abadzis of, who did this book, Leica from First Second Publishing. And Leica is the story of a dog, but a very special dog, right? For those who haven't, who don't remember the name Leica. Uh, <laughs> hey, Nick. <laughs> so, uh, could you tell us a little bit about about what Leica is? Like, give us like the the the, the log line that you've used probably countless times over the last couple of years. It's a biography of the, uh, the the first Earthling in 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 orbit around the planet Earth, um, and you know she was uh, sent up with the second ever satellite, Sputnik Two. Um, and not a lot was known about her life before I uh, wrote and illustrated that book. So it's become a sort of biography of her. Um, and there's a, it's, it's, I would hesitate to call it, uh, I think it's more historical fiction um, in the sense that um, I had to join a lot of dots. Um, not everything in there is... Uh, is uh, it's very heavily researched, but not every single scene in there is is true to life in the sense that I drew it from an actual passage of history. So uh, there is an element of historical fiction in there too. Well, this is something I want to dig at for like the, the greater topic uh, is a roundtable discussion today that I think is a common element between you guys is that one of the things you did that I think is super fascinating about Leica, Nick, is that you got inside the mind of the dog. You, uh -huh. you you told the story of the dog from the dog's point of view at times, but then you're also telling about like the political things that are going on and like why they were in such a rush to get this dog in outer space. The story of the trainer and what happens to her psychologically, uh, and and what her relationship with this dog becomes, and how what what that means when she has to lock that hatch for the final time, putting the dog in space, which is really. I mean, I, I got it bookmarked right here. The scene where, and we're going to talk about this in a, in a second, but she she. Uh, puts the dog, locks the hatch, and then goes to the car, and there's this beautiful panel of her just sitting in the car, sobbing in uh -huh. silence. And man, in the context of the story, what a powerful scene that is. So emotionally tough, that scene. But yeah, so it's, there's a lot of layers to this book, and it's one of the, I mean, at the risk of sounding like, uh, you know, I'm glad handling, but I, I'm sure authors like hearing this, it's one of the finest comics I've ever read uh, in, in my life. So, I'm with you on that. Yeah, I, here's, here's the story I like to share, is that I talk about this book a lot in my comics classes uh, as being, you know, whenever you talk about a book and you're recommending a book to somebody, you always have to qualify it. Well, if you like it, if you like this kind of stuff, you might like this. But if you don't like this, if you don't like vampire romance, you're not going to like this, right? That kind of thing. 
This is one of those rare books where I can't imagine the person who wouldn't like this book. It's really hard for me to say, like, if you like reading, <laughs> if you enjoy reading things, you will like this book, regardless of your background, regardless of whether you like the space program or not, because it's so excellently done. It's so, uh, but anyway, so I did this in class. I was talking to my, my classroom, and there was uh, a bunch of kids. And, and there was this mother uh, in her late 30s, early 40s, who doesn't read comics, but she was there to, you know, make sure her kid was okay in the classroom. And uh, she, she had no interest in reading comics, but I told her about this book, and I said, look, if, if you don't cry when you read this, you have no soul. I mean, that's just all there is to it. And so she took it home, and she read it, and she came back, and she, was, she looked, you know, ashen, and she said that it was heartbreaking. Is there anything else like that? And then I thought, I thought, oh, damn. I, now I've, I've, I've doomed this moment because I gave her this first. <laughs> Now what am I going to recommend this one? But then she was checking out all these different... So you were the, the entry point for, uh, you know, late 30s, early 40s woman to suddenly fall in love with our beloved medium. So that's pretty cool. That, that, that was, that's interesting you, you pick up on that because that was one of the uh, original ideas for the book. I mean, when Mark Siegel and I were first talking about um, doing the book together, he said, can you do a graphic novel that will be accessible to almost anyone? Can you make a comic that anyone will be able to pick up and read. And I, in my, my, my great uh, overweening confidence, went, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking, how the hell am I going to do that? So your body but, language betrayed you a little bit, but uh, the, <laughs> Mark just focused on the words then. Yeah. It's, um, but it was, uh, uh, I mean, we just finished up uh, uh, the New York Comic Con um, here, here in, uh, in, in New York City. And a couple of people um, came to me at the first, second stand when I, while I was doing a signing for a, a, the new nursery rhymes book we've got out. Um, and uh, they said, well, this was the first graphic novel I ever read. You know, you got me into comics. So it, it does seem to have worked on, on, on some level. Um, I'm not really sure whether I can take uh, credit for that, though. I think it's a story that um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a point of history, which I think is incredibly important. And I try to do it justice as best I can. Um, and there are a lot of themes in there, which are, you know, obviously of my own interest, sort of rise into the to the fore. But um, but it's it's kind of an incredible story in its own right. I think it just it just needed to be dramatized in the right way, and uh, and that's what I did. Well, I think you can take credit for that uh, because the as you said, the story was there. It's been there for sixty odd years now, yeah. and yeah. So, somebody's got to pick it up and somebody has to do something with it. And that's what Leica and you did. So don't, don't sell yourself so far short. <laughs> <laughs> you get to do a little bit of the baseball player double-fisted shake over the shoulders with this one, I think. Uh, both of you guys do, because this, is the, the, this leads into like the, one of the first questions I want to ask both of you guys. Is that, uh, you know, these are, these are topics that... Oh, we, we still live in a world where the majority of at least United States citizens think of comics, they think of that horrible Bam Pow, Comics Aren't For Kids headline, or, you know, superheroes, as much as I love superheroes, you know, I'm, I'm a purveyor of lighthearted, you know, action fiction. Uh, but to the general public, if you say, uh, when I tell people, like, oh, have you read, you know, the biography of Niels Bohr by, by uh, Jim Taviani, and they're like, somebody made a comic about Niels, Niels Bohr, are you kidding me? Uh, so people are still caught off guard by the subject matter being captured in comics. So the question is, like, why, why comics as a media? And this is going to be preaching to the choir a little bit, you know, for the people who are listening. But we do have our share of uh, listeners who are librarians and non-practitioners. So I'm wondering if you could ex express what was it about this medium that makes it appropriate or compelling to tell these kinds of stories in? Because you guys do some really interesting stuff visually to communicate these ideas in comics. I'm wondering if you could speak to that at all, Jim. Okay, I, I, can, I can start, and I'm going to narrow the question down a yeah. little bit further okay. to why, why would you even do comics about science and scientists? And if I had more visuals, I would say it's because of alchemy, and I would show you an al a sample of alchemical texts, and you'd see that, A, there's no pictures, and B, there's almost no communication going on either. It's all about obscuring what you've found. And typically that's, a, that's good news because most alchemists actually found nothing of practical use most of the time. But we're sitting, uh, at least uh, Jersey and I are sitting here in the library, 
And what I would then suggest to people is go, go down to the literature section and start flipping through the books and the magazines and the literary journals and things like that. And notice what you're seeing and what you're not seeing. And then head over to the science section and start flipping through and notice what you're seeing and what you're not seeing. And what you'll see in science that you won't see in the literature areas, even in the, and maybe even especially in the hardcore areas, is lots of pictures in the science stuff and almost nothing in the, the literary criticism in the novels and things like that. Not too surprising in that we think of a novel as, as being purely prose. But it is surprising to most folks that science and scientists communicate with pictures constantly, all the time. It's, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to avoid them. So why not go all the way <laughs> <laughs> with that then and communicate the, the story of science and scientific discovery and science with words and pictures uh, intermingled together. Co comics really works well for it, I think. Well, in the books you do, I would, I would agree 100% with that. <laughs> I've got a bunch of examples that I want to talk about a little bit here. Uh, wow, yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, when you look at a science textbook, there's always visualizations of concepts, right? Right. You know, you read um, Hawking's book, uh, Brief History of Time, and he starts talking about spin particles, and he's like, well, here, here's a chart, or here's a diagram, or here's a visual representation, here's a metaphor to explain this very, very strange concept. How can a particle, when you spin it one, mm -hmm. one way, it doesn't look the same when you spin it twice or right. three times, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah, it's an abstract idea. Right. So, I don't know, Nick, did you have any thoughts you wanted to lend to this? Like, why, why you think uh, a comic would be more appropriate for this kind of story? Or why did you decide you want to do a comic in this style or for this story rather than, you know, just write a book, write, write a prose book? Because then you'd reach a wider audience, probably. Uh, well, uh, comics is my language. Yeah. Comics is the language I've spoken ever since I was very, very young. Um, and it's, it's, it's the way I think. I, I think in words and pictures. Um, and I'd probably go a step further than Jim to say that it, it, it's not merely, a, it, it, it's not the intermingling, it's the marriage of, of text and imagery and the flow between them and also between the, the gutters, between the panels um, and the pages, the turning of the pages, the little cliffhanger you get at the, e the end of each page that creates a kind of uh, uh, an immersiveness to comics that you don't get. Um, in, a, in another visual medium, or even uh, a, a non-visual medium, um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer that comics is probably the kind of finest communications medium ever developed by humankind. And really, what we've got now is something that stretches right back to the cave paintings and you know the hieroglyphics you used to find on um, yeah, in, in Egyptian tombs and such like. Um, I really think that we. Uh, we've inherited that mantle and, and we're taking it forward because so in the world that we live in today you know we're, I'm sitting here talking to you on a computer screen which is covered in iconography uh, which are distilled versions it's all symbols of the way we speak the way we communicate and I think comics isn't really far removed from that it's, it's a very pure way of communicating with a, a readership or, or an audience um, and whether you do it on a page and what I'm seeing a lot of nowadays is uh, is people um, uh, projecting their comic panels up on big screens and doing the voices and talking about them. So it's expanding and changing the grammar of it and the, the syntax is changing all the time. Um, it's an incredibly flexible storytelling medium. So for me, there wasn't ever really a choice. I, mean, I do a lot of writing as well. Um, and I've, uh, I actually um, helped create in, in the UK a, uh, a magazine called Horrible Histories, which based on a, a series of books um, published by Scholastic and the company I work for, Eagle Moss Publications, did a magazine based on that and we developed this um, and uh, that gave me a lot of experience in, I'm very interested in history obviously, and, but that magazine developing it gave me a lot of experience in, uh, in um, putting a, a point of history across in, a, in an effective manner. We, we used a lot of humour in that magazine. Um, but I always had in the back of my mind the way I would do it, you know, as, as not a licensed property. And, and Leica is partly, partially the result of that. It was, it was a labour of love, you know, something that I'd had before I even worked on that 
magazine as an idea lurking at the back of my consciousness, but um, it was really sort of like a lot of the things I learned on that magazine that kind of made it out into the world. What, a, what an awesome segue you just provided me with, because that was the next thing I was going to ask you guys about was um, why this particular subject matter, why you're so gripped by it, you know? It's like uh, most people know who Carl Sagan is, right, in his famous series Cosmos. And one of the things I think they did that was really awesome in that series was he expressed his enthusiasm for his subject matter by making the past scientists, his predecessors, into heroes. He talks about Kepler and the nested solids, and he really chronicles the, like, the, the pain and passion of trying to work this nested solids model into a workable theory of the universe, and it doesn't work, and then he trips upon the right answer, and like, it's because he persisted, and it's because he did these things that, that he's a great man that we should all respect and revere, and you, hear, you, you find yourself getting really excited about the subject, and I think about it, something another orator once said about uh, this, this concept called aesthetic arrest. You're arrested by something that just grips you with beauty. Uh, with its beauty. Um, what is it about these, these, these historical figures, these scientific people, like, like the space program, all this stuff, what is it about it that, that grips you guys? And I'm just, the reason I'm asking if you could describe that is for the cartoonist out there who's listening, who's saying like, but I don't know what to write about. I don't know what I'm interested in. I don't know what, what's lit me on fire yet. Like, how did you guys land on that? Do you know, can you, can you speak to that? Or is that kind of like, I know it's a tough one. Uh, for me, it's almost trivial. Because yeah. I come from a science background. Yeah. And so the way I often describe this is, so I'm studying uh, nuclear engineering, which is what I did prior to being a librarian, prior to being a comic book writer. Typical career path. Um, <laughs> and I'm learning all these names of people, you know, Bohr, Heisenberg, uh, Feynman, etc. And it's almost like the, that scene in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid where, you know, there's that posse always chasing and they're like who are these guys yeah and I started to want to know who those people were because they clearly influenced my career like it or not uh, because I was using what they had discovered and it turns out that they were very interesting people uh, li they lived through in interesting times and they did interesting things uh, I'm not sure that there's anything else that you need to create a story than interesting people, interesting times. I should should say that different. Interesting <laughs> people doing interesting things during interesting times. What more could you ask for? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, it seemed dead obvious. I mean, the the way Nick was describing, you know, he he, the, this is this is his language, uh, speaking in comics, and I think that that that's just a follow on. To, to the way you describe, you know, how you come to communicate the things that you want to talk about. And that was the language that I was uh, becoming versed in and, you know, reading comics at the same time. Are, are you also speaking to then like a sense of like observation? You know, like you were talking about, you know, going down to the stacks in the library and looking through the science section. What do you notice? What do you do not notice? Like, mm -hmm. they, like a, a sense of intentional observation. You know, one of the things that I run into with young, uh, less inspired students, like students who are really struggling with, you know, because I, I teach comics classes and then right. there's some kids who are like, I just don't know what to write about. And so then I tell them, go for a walk with a camera and take a picture of anything that you see that's neat and then bring it back and we'll look at these pictures and we're going to like identify what are the common themes between these things to start to try to find your voice. Uh, and that happens. That helps sometimes, but there's always that, that, that one reluctant student who is just, I just don't have anything to say, but I want to do this so bad. So I was just trying to get at the, like, the heart of, like, maybe observation is, is yeah, part of I the think, key. Yeah, I think that would be, I mean, certainly I never start writing a book with page one, panel one. It's always page X, panel X, because there's an interesting image that has caught me. It's the, it's the go out and take a photograph of interesting things you see. It's almost always the image that starts the actual writing process. Mm. So I, all, all by way of saying, I wouldn't know what to say to that kid. <laughs> Nick, help. <laughs> yeah, help us out here, Nick. <laughs> um, I, it's, it, it, it is a tough question. I mean, it's what makes you passionate. Um, and I'm reminded of a, I can't recall the precise nature of the quote, but it's something, or who made it, um, but it's something like, um, you know, your life's work is a, 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 an attempt to re recall those great works of art in, in whose presence your heart first opened. 
Mm. Um, and I think that to a certain extent, you know, when you respond to something as a child, um, and I did the comic. Oh, I think we might have lost him for whenever we. Oh, Nick, you still there? Can you hear me? Yeah, we lost you just for a second. Yeah, sorry, slight disconnect. Um, no, throughout my, I was just saying throughout my scholastic career, I had plenty of teachers who thought that I read too many comics. But, um, and I probably did, uh, and which is why I went down this career path. But uh, it's, it was, um, I, it's storytelling um, for me. I mean, uh, I, I was always interested in science, obviously, uh, but uh, my math let me down. Um, I was all equally interested in history, so history is a way by which I can explore science, um, and comics is a way through which I can explore almost any kind of um, uh, story that I that I care to think about. Really, um, yeah, I think you can do anything in comics. Um, uh, so I think your 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 idea of walking along the road with a with a camera and um, telling students to kind of um, take a picture of anything they find interesting is, is a really good idea because you you can make a comic about anything and often you make the best comics with some kind of constraint, some kind of uh, um, small grammatical tick where you say, okay, you can only use five panels to tell this story or you can't use, um, you, you, you can use speech balloons but you're only allowed to put one word in each speech balloon. Yeah. And, how to lose, use seven speech balloons for ten pages or whatever, and those are the points by which you know the story's got to progress. These weird kind of um, little constraints like that can sometimes throw up very very interesting results, and it's those sorts of exercises that get um, students really thinking, and it begins to kind of unloosen some of that stuff where where you know creative passion is contained. Uh, I know I'm speaking in quite grandiose metaphorical terms. <laughs> Uh, uh, that seems to be the way it works for me. Um, uh, a, a lot of my day is spent um, kind of unfastening some of these kind of uh, things in my mind. And, and um, I start the day by doing a lot of sketching and a lot of kind of doodling and trying to loosen up and allow stuff through that will just, you know, so that this flow begins to happen. Um, is that so, the function of your subway drawings? Yeah, I was just going to mention that. That's something we should throw out a plug for. Uh, is that at nickabadzis.com or is that on a different uh, URL? It's actually a different URL. If you can get to it, if you go to uh, nickabadzis.com and, pre and press the blog button, and that will take you straight to the Expressions blog where that's hosted. Um, uh, but yeah, that is largely the function of those. It's a way of, um, I mean, that's observational drawing rather mm -hmm. than, um, than, than anything storytelling. And it's a way of sort of... Um, just kind of loosening up and, and practicing. And I, I also do a lot of, um, I don't know if I've got any here, just kind of wild sketches in the sketchbook. I don't know if you can see any of that stuff. Oh, yeah. But just kind of kind of crazy drawings that, um, that, that um, and there's all sorts of, anything that will kind of, um, you know. Um, Wait, was that a cow in some kind of a hover ship? Oh yeah, that's Bunty the mutant cow. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I, of course. I should have recognized her. Um, she's in a story that hasn't appeared yet. I don't know whether it will or not. Um, <laughs> still trying to find a publisher for that one, folks. You know, so you've got the observational stuff alongside mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, the 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 crazy robots. I always seem to find that I default to drawing robots when um. I can't think of anything to draw, so my my, uh, my sketchbooks are littered with these sort of insane robots. And I think I kept thinking about doing a blog solely devoted to robots, um, and, and and you know other other crazed sort of um, characters. But the, um, the the observational drawings on the subway are actually kind of believe it or not a way into that that part of my my subconscious where all this other stuff exists. Wow! So it's yeah. observational drawing um, kind of as a lead-in. In, in, into that, and also I, I love drawing people. I really, really do love looking at people, and just it kind of sparks ideas about character and about stories. They say you can't judge a book by its cover, and I'm sure that if I, I ever were to talk to any one of these people that I observe on the subway and draw, they'd be totally different to how I expect them to be. Um, but that's kind of part of the beauty of it, really. That you know, you can you can observe. And, and kind of make a great little portrait and stick it up on a blog and 
and then that will, for me at least, it will it will it will take me somewhere else. Yeah, it's a journey. <laughs> well, God, you guys are so awesome because this is once again you're leading me right into where I want to go with this. Uh, I I don't have to fight you guys at all with this episode. Um, the sense of observation and watching somebody, knowing that they're probably not what you expect, or there might be something else inside of there that you might be surprised by. Uh, Let's talk about, this is the big idea that I wanted to approach today, is that the common thing between you guys is that you write historical comics about real people, you know, Leica, people around her, Feynman. Uh, how, how do you get inside? And this, I think this is going to be very analogous to what a, a person who writes fiction does, but I wonder if we come and attack this from the standpoint of the specific concerns you guys have in doing these kinds of books where you don't know Feynman personally, but you have a lot of historical records. We have a lot of date. We have a lot of biographies written. He spoke a lot, right? right. Uh, Leica, there was there was information to, to to dig up about this. But how do you get inside the mind of this character and then express this character through your story in a way that you feel is honest and portraying them as best you can? But then also, you know, you want to be an author too. You want to you want to highlight what's what's important to you as an author about this person. I'm sure. Um, one of the things that, uh, and this is just like a side note, but I just want to start this as the lead-in of uh, talking about getting inside of your characters' heads and, and starting to understand them, is Sharon Iverson, the librarian at the Ann Arbor District Library, was on the show last week, and she was just glowing about this book, uh, which means that all librarians who are listening right now should put this in their collections. You won't be sorry. And I can say this as a cartoonist and as somebody who uses his library regularly. Um, but she said, like, if you read this, it's like a metaphor for cartooning because Feynman had this, this uh, he walked both sides of, of the implicit and the explicit in his work. He, he taught visually and he worked with artists to learn how to work more visually. He took art classes mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and also he had uh, synesthesia. Is that the, 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 I think that's how you pronounce it, yeah. Which is where uh, he, he was a highly visual person. He saw letters and numbers and colors. Right, it's typically when, when the senses cross over so you taste sound or you hear a color so or something. Weird. Thing like that, yeah, it's very. But but which is like what we do with cartooning, right? It's like when you design a sound effect, you got to design. Okay, how do I spell it? First, I got to figure out how like the quality of the sound. Is it like a thudish? Is there any vowels in there? And then you got to design letters mm -hmm. that look like the sound. Like is it going to have a wavy line or a soft line? Now, what color is it? Whenever I say that to my students, they're like, "What are you talking about, you hippie?" But that's totally what we have to do. So it seems like people with synesthesia would be like perfect cartoonists. I, w I would imagine that it would help because <laughs> yeah. some some of, some of the choices go away. I mean, obviously. The, the quadratic equation is green. So, you know, <laughs> I've never experienced that myself, right. but probably for someone like Feynman, it's obvious right. that, that it must be green. I, I think Nick's answer to this question is going to be much more interesting than mine. Yes. Because... Well, I'm not going to say it's more interesting than yours, but it's going to be very interesting because, yeah, because go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm just going to get mine out of the way so we can listen to Nick. <laughs> uh, it was mostly about spending a great deal of time reading and listening to recorded uh, lectures, uh, just chats. I, I, I had the good fortune of uh, being acquainted with Ralph Layton, who recorded Feynman throughout a lot of his later life. And mm -hmm. so a lot of these stories, these famous anecdotes that Feynman would tell about himself, these, are, these come to us via Ralph having recorded them. And so having access to, to a lot of that. And he's made a great deal of that public. Uh, and as a result of having that material available, it's almost as simple as just soaking in it yeah. for as long as your deadline will allow you to do. Uh, Feynman had, it has a very unique voice and right. presentation style and a very clear sense of character when you hear the man talk. Right. You know, he, he was very interested in creating stories about himself. Yeah. Uh, so he, he was not shy about going out and seeking out adventure or something crazy to happen just so he could have, have something interesting to say the next time he and Ralph got together to play bongos yeah. or, you know, at the next party he went to. So... Listening, imagining what it would be like uh, if you if you were able to ask this person a, a question, what would what would that answer sound like? What would that answer be? Mm -hmm. And then trying just trying to get it down on the page in some way, the cadence. Uh, the, I the think you did rhythm. it. I, I hope so. I, it, I'm, I think thanks. you did in the in the, the rhythm of the dialogue and when you have him talking in the classroom experiences. Uh, 
you know, it, you, you can almost hear that, that almost Benjamin Grimm, the ever-loving blue-eyed thing voice coming out of his mouth. Yeah, you know, he, he, he lived in uh, Southern California for most of his adult life, and he made sure he sounded like he was from Brooklyn <laughs> till the day he died. He, you know, he, he cultivated that accent and held on to it as hard as he, hard as he could. And, and, that, and that, in part, made the job very easy because then you can just, all right, so who do I know that's a Brooklyn native? I got, you know, I'll think about that person yeah. when, when I'm writing. And, and, of course, thinking about Feynman. But, but again, I think Nick, I, I want to hear Nick cause yes, because, yes, yeah. These, these characters are less well documented than Feynman is, I think. And nobody's ever been inside the mind of a dog. Right. As far as I know. And so. that's another thing, too, that I think, Nick, you did really exceptionally well, is you wrote a dog's dialogue that felt absolutely authentic to me. I mean, it didn't feel like cutesy, forced, affected dialogue. You yeah, know? it wasn't like, oh, yeah, that's doggy talk. It's yeah. like, oh, like is talking now. Yeah. Got it. But it, it, but it, it has a completely different rhythm and cadence than any of the other characters in the right. story. And it's, it has, like, you know how, like, a dog will come running up to you and it'll have this, like, ex uh, expression of exclamation when it's seeing you as if it's saying your name with an exclamation point, right? That's it. That's all it's thinking. And you do that when she, uh, whenever she approaches her trainer. But then I, I'll let you talk now because I'm just going to start gushing. So go ahead. Yeah. I, uh, I, I made a decision very early on because I did, uh, uh, when I first kind of approached the story, it was maybe you know 20 25 pages long i was going to do a short story mm. and i experimented with that and i did an early page of artwork which actually had the dog properly talking um you know like a an anthropomorphized uh disney cute animal something like that mm. and, uh, and i made the decision very early on that if that was going to occur in the book at all it had to occur through the lens of well through through from the point of view of one of the characters so it, it, whenever Laika kind of appears to talk, she does it. She actually don't, um, does it through the um, through the perceptions of one of the characters, almost as if the character is anthropomorphizing the dog. And the rest of the time, I wanted her to be like a dog. You know, it was all about observing animals and dogs and the way that they behave towards their um, uh, their, their masters and mistresses. Um, and I think that that was important because you know, in the real world. Animals don't speak. We, 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 we sort of imbue them with those qualities to a huge degree. Um, you know, they do have personalities, but they can't speak. They can't tell you how they're feeling. You can, you can intuit it um, if you know your, 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 your animals. But, um, but um, to a huge degree, we do, sort of, we do sort of form that around them. So it was really important to kind of um, somehow address that within the, pa within the pages of the book. Um, so sometimes I wanted her very much behaving dog-like, you know, without any kind of human influence. So I think, I mean, where the character of Laika herself was concerned, or Kudri Avkar, as she's known mostly throughout the book, um, she, she was, uh, it, it was important to me to kind of have her, she starts out, you know, as a, you know, she's, she's in a warm little home, and then she's a street nut, and then she's a Cosmo dog. She goes through these, uh, these evolutions, and, um, and it was important to kind of address each one as a sort of individual aspect of her character. She was all these things and none of them. She, these were perceptions from the, you know, put upon her by the human characters in the book. And as for the human characters, um, I mean, uh, Karolio, the, uh, the, the chief engineer, um, I mean, there has been quite a lot of stuff written about him, um, which is all uh, post the fall of the USSR because prior to that time, nobody really knew who he was. They didn't know that he existed. And he was this really remarkable individual who, uh, to a huge degree, through his own willpower and political maneuvering, um, corralled, marshaled the forces of these, these small Soviet agencies uh, to appear like one huge kind of um, Soviet space effort. And, and he rallied that against, you know, the, the US space effort, which really was this huge, you know, uh, aerospace industry. Um, so he was this very, very driven individual, um, and uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's been some, some um, good biographies that are done of him. Um, so I could find that, that kind of thing, but when it, I mean, there's an awful lot of other stuff to do with um, some of the peripheral characters and supporting characters, which was a lot murkier, which was really, really difficult to come across, so I had to hunt in a lot of places, and 
unearth a lot of um, material in um, all sorts of places, um, from the British Library, um, from the, the Museum of Cosmonautics in Moscow, from the uh, Smithsonian Institute, um, who had a really, really great audiovisual uh, archive. Um, I've got a lot of good information there. So you put all these pieces together and you, you read a lot, you, um, you immerse yourself in the video footage and the interviews, everything you can get. And then you forget about it. <laughs> you forget about everything. And you have your characters and you, um, you, 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 you and it's, it's, sort of a, it's sort of a Stanislavskian thing where you sort of, you immerse yourself in all the history, but then you create your own version of them. And I, and I think that, that was, that's an important point to make because, I mean, the characters in my book are not necessarily the way somebody else would write them. They might not pick up on certain character ticks about Karolyov or, or, or Yazdowski that I did. Um, but I got all the good information that, that I could. And, and there's a, since I wrote the book, since I, um, since I wrote the, the, the thumbnail bit, um, a lot of new information has come to light that I didn't know about. So I guess if I was... If I was writing it today, I might not have written it the way that I ended up writing it. But um, and all writing is a process of judicious self-editing. Um, so you know there was a, a sort of much longer, unwieldier version of that story where if you had put all that stuff in, it might not flow in quite the way that it does. Uh, I know that I talk about flow an awful lot when I talk about comics writing, and uh, but it is important and and getting characters from history and interweaving them with your own um, characters. Because not all the characters in the book are, are, are actually from real history. Some of them are invented by me. And they're invented for the purpose of um, giving Lyca some backstory um, and uh, uh, putting what I did know about the way the Cosmo dogs were trained um, and, and putting that against a, a character who would, uh, you know, have some thoughts and feelings about that, be not reactionary, but... Uh, be an observer, if you like. It's that old observational thing coming back into play. As I say, you guys are constructing a, a full-on writing course uh, between the two of you today. It's like, first start out observing the world and observing things that grab you and arrest you in some way. Something that says interesting, and then immerse yourself in all of that observation until you have some kind of conclusion, and then you edit the heck out of it, and then you've got a story of some sort. I mean, it sounds like it's an ABC thing. It's totally not. But, I mean, at least it's, it's a framework for approaching it, right? Well, it's an A, B, you know, C. <laughs> Five years later, you right. it, yeah, you get to D, right? Oh, awesome. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the visual aspects of what you guys do. And uh, I don't know if this is too highfalutin to me to say that, you know, there's a, po a poetry to what you guys do in your work. I think so any at any rate. Let's look at the first spread from... Uh, like uh, where we begin the story with uh, a white panel sequence that leads to a snowy scene where one of the main characters is trudging through the snow. And then we're going to look at the ending sequence of the story where the rocket is going into space and it ends in blackness and a mirroring of the opening of the story. What an amazing coincidence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just landed on that, right, Nick? No, I mean, there's, there's a lot that you guys do visually to reinforce ideas and to express, like, sophisticated ideas and also like, express a tone, right? I mean, this had to be intentional, yes? Yeah, it's intentional. And if you, if you um, turn to page 100 or 101, um, you'll see that there's another black and white juxtaposition um, and that reoccurs at several points throughout the book. Um, and yeah, it's a... Are you talking about right here where... Um, yeah, if you look, look, sort of look at those, um, um, those two panels down at the bottom there, um, one's white, one's black, and there's that sort of balance on the page. Um, so I've got this yin-yang thing going on, um, and that's important to me in any book, is this sense of balance. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, there's there's a there's a couple more scenes where you see that in there, and it it's structure the structure the underlying structure of uh, any story is very very important to me, um, and I don't think that in comics it's talked about enough. I think the kind of most important part. Oh, here's another part. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but this is when Leica is going off to the final end of the story. There's another sequence here with the black and white panels. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, those things can be very powerful, very simple imagery, um, and uh, it's, 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 if it's part of your vocabulary, my feeling is that you should use it. Uh, it's, um, 
you know, you, you can you, you can play with a sense of scale in comics like probably almost no other um, medium, maybe film these days with everything that's CGI. Well, I don't know. I mean, because there's also a sense of simultaneity that you get in comics that you can't get anyplace else. Look at the scene from the launch, and we're watching across the bottom the reactions of the people in the control room, as well as switching back and forth between them and Laika, who's being pressed down by the gravity or the G-forces of, of the launch, right? So there's a lot of things happening all at the same time, and we as readers totally get what the, what's going on here, right? Uh, we know how to right, read Time this. is flowing up there. Time is probably not flowing very fast nearly as fast yeah. in the reaction that's, that's shot. A, Jim, that's a really, really good point. The, um, this is something that comics can do. Um, you, can, you can slow down or speed up the pacing of which you're, you know, so your, re your reader can experience these dual time streams. Sort of get them at the same pace, even though they're not actually flowing within the reality of the comic in the same right. way. The same way but. Yeah, and here's an example, and this is why everybody should watch the video uh, instead of the audio, but here's an example from <laughs> Jim's book where, and this is a great, great scene because this is something where a lot of us artists have experienced this, where Feynman's at a party with an artist friend, they're trying to impress a lady, and Feynman says, uh, kids can do better than what I see in museums, they don't know what they're doing uh, other than pulling our legs, and so the artist says, uh, I want you to do the most outlandish, idiotic, crazy drawing that you can possibly do, and throws a blank piece of paper in front of him. And Feynman uh, characteristically says, sure, give me those, I'll show you. And he sits down to the sequence at the bottom. And if you could, if you could explain this one, Jim. Well, he, he's faced with the blank page, as so, so many of us are so often. <laughs> and it goes blank in the, in, the middle, in the middle of that tier. And there he is again, still facing the blank page. And obviously the notion, you know, we're, we're playing with the paper that the book is made out of. Mm -hmm. uh, we're playing with the scene. We're playing with that time thing that Nick, Nick was just describing. Yeah. Uh, and the difficulty of actually creating something outlandish on command. Right. And, well, and what I love about this is like, okay, if you would have just had it be a wide panel with him just sitting there, it'd be about how he's paused and how he is not, uh, not coming up with anything. But by making it a giant white gutter, what it does for me as a reader is it's like, here's his state of mind, too. Yep. Right? It's blank. There's nothing there. Create something outlandish. So it's not only re referencing the sense of space, but also has this expressionistic element to it as well, as mm -hmm. using like the whiteness to also represent the character's state of mind. That's something that would be very, very difficult to do in a film. Right? It would. And I want you to also notice, and again, for those who aren't seeing this via the video, you'll notice that Leland did something extremely yeah, subtle that I did not point out, or I didn't ask for. This is the nice thing about working with artists, because you, you get more than you ask for oftentimes. But there's just a subtle change in expression. It look, uh, at a glance, and probably yeah, the through shot. the video, you no, won't here, be able we'll to it, tell. I'll put it like this in my shots. So they can cut to me while you, while you explain it. But yes, his, fa his expression does get a little bit more frustrated. It's just a little bit. Yeah. And, and uh, Hillary, with the colors, tweak the colors just a little bit to, to darken, and, and this could be uh, a printing artifact that just a uh, happy accident, but that's one of the other things that's so wonderful about uh, storytelling and comics in general. You can have happy accidents and, <laughs> and uh, it works out great. But all, all of those things combine to, I think, get the effect that you were describing and hoping for. And Let's talk about color, guys, because this is another thing that Feynman is rich with, as well as Leica, is you use a lot of color keying for different scenes. And I'm mm -hmm. sure this was very intentional. There are scenes that are very purple, and then there are scenes where, yeah, so here's like a very a, a lot of cool color keying going on. Right. And then there's scenes where there's more warm color keying going on, where you use like a, you know, a very limited palette on right. there. And was, know this, uh -huh. I had almost nothing to do with the color. Really? And in fact, my initial reaction and concern was, oh my gosh, the color is so expressionistic. I'm worried about this. Really? And Leland said, it'll be okay, man. <laughs> just just let it let it go. Wait wait till you see the whole book. And I was wrong. He was right. It it was okay. The only place that we had to be really careful and maybe back off on some of that was in, in some of the descriptions of the science where uh, I think all our electrons are white letter on a black background, and all our protons are red background with black lettering. And 
you, you, you're mis you're remembering it differently. But anyway. Oh no, no, I'm 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 just confused as to why that would have to be so important. Well, the, it's not important that those specific colors, but what was important was now you can't change it on the next page just because it's going to look cooler. Oh. Because there there are times when you want to use color as a signpost and uh, and not as emotional content. And there are other times, and this is where I my initial inclination was wrong. It, I'm I'm always for signifying mm -hmm. specific things and making it very clear for the reader. Not so much always about the emotional use of color, but there are many more times in that book than not that that's exactly the right thing to do. And that's what my initial worry was, and I was like I said wrong about wrong to be worried about that. Interesting. Have I taken, I've taken you down a path you didn't. No, no, I, no. I, 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 lo I love going down rabbit holes because <laughs> that's where you find some really interesting stuff. I mean, you, so in other words, let me try to get to the bottom of what you're saying here. So you're saying that expressionism is potentially dangerous because it's willy nilly, and it's no, not, no, 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 it... no. It wasn't willy nilly at all. I just didn't see it that. W I just didn't see it correctly. Okay. Uh, the only time when expressionism in my books would be inappropriate is if you are trying to guide people through a fairly abstract notion and you need to always you need you need consistency over anything else well you've just got to be more diagrammatic is that what you're saying thank you that's a better way to put it yes okay okay so yeah and then nick you do the same thing i mean there's lots of scenes in here where all of a sudden we have a, a sequence of characters on a field of green talking to each other and I know that this is partially while well, they're in this environment where the that paint color might be on the wall but I'm also noticing it as a series like there's scenes where everything gets very red when they're in the control room and there's the tension of the lead up to the big event right and well, yeah I mean I, I put um, poor Hillary through the grinder on this book <laughs> uh, by fire for her because I had some I had a lot of very very specific requirements of the coloring. Um, so I suppose it would be true to say that, you know, that we, uh, we collaborated on that. Um, I mean, she's, you know, she's a, a, a very astute and fine colorist in her own right, but um, she probably isn't as, as experienced as me in terms of kind of the overall grammar of comics. So I wanted to have these very, very specific uh, emotional junctures, uh, which I wanted to point up. Um, so that's why there are certain scenes which are which are red, which are um, you know, and with, or you get roiling clouds at some point later on in the story, um, and all of the all of the kind of um, the sort of painterly uh, backdrops that you can see. I, I actually put those in and had very specific requirements of Hillary for what to do on those, hmm. and um, um, she was she was very very patient. She <laughs> she. Uh, she'd send me a kind of rough version, and I'd kind of, okay, more orange, we need more <laughs> orange there. So it's, it, it's a bit like, I suppose, the relationship between um, the director of a film and a, and a film editor, where, um, you know, you, let's cut at a certain point and bring up, the, you know, the color tones here and do something there to kind of really kind of make this, make the emotion of this scene or the kind of, you know, this, the other requirements of the scene mean, make them as sharp as they possibly can be for that scene. So, so yeah, my feeling about color is that it's all part of the grammar of comics, and you have to use it wisely. Um, and uh, a, a good colorist will help you out there, um, or if you're coloring your own work, um, as, as I often do, it's uh, you've got to know what you're doing. You've really, really got to kind of think about, um, you know, the, the line drawings that you're coloring, and what precise, you know, how you want to come, what you want the mood of the scene to achieve. Right. Yeah, here's the scene where Leica's in the uh, rocket, and it's a pro it, this is after we've discovered that she ain't coming back. And uh, she's currently going through this dream sequence of, you know, gently floating toward the sun. And in her dream sequences, Leica's colored white. But then in the reality of her slowly <laughs> burning and suffocating, uh, a brutal, emotionally brutal scene, she's all colored in washes of orange, right? And then it's a simple little, it's a, it's a, tiny tiny difference but it really affects how each moment feels differently right well, i think I've, I've got to kind of um uh, credit hillary with the kind of way she lit certain scenes she um you know she had a lot of great ideas and um 
she'd sort of routinely put these kind of washes over everything. Um, you know, in Photoshop, she uses Photoshop. But, um, she's an addict, so uh, it, 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 it all came together extremely well in, in, in the end. It was very quick how it turned out. So you, you mentioned uh, an understanding of color is very important. Do you have offhand, and I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here, this was not in my list of topics that I wanted to touch on, but it just occurred to me that do you have a recommendation on like any good books to really study color theory? This is like a, an area where a lot of students have, uh, you know, you start saying color theory, what? That's an abstract, weird idea. But comics, that's an interesting question, so nothing kind of immediately comes oh, to mind. Oh, doesn't, it doesn't have to be comics. I mean, just something that studies, like, use of color for application. Because we, we should be in, uh, encouraging people, too, to read and study other art forms and f forms of communication besides comics, right? I don't know if there's a specific um, term that I could mention. Um, I mean, I, I mean there's, there's some really good how-to books out there about kind of like, you know, the creation of comics and the storytelling, all mm -hmm. of which... I would imagine, I haven't read all of them, um, at least touch upon that. Yeah. And, and, and more and more, more and more kind of comics these days are color. I mean, you talk to a lot of cartoons, they'll talk about black and white art being the highest amongst them. If you look at an artist like, say, Jose Munoz uh, or, or Jaime Hernandez is another, who use the balance of black and white on the page. So you, you come away from it kind of completely unaware that, um, that there's no color there. To all intents and purposes, while you're reading it, there is. It's a, a it's a, a rainbow hued world because those artists' use of black and white is so extraordinary. Um, but um, I know I'm getting off this, the, uh, the, the the question a little bit. I'm, I can't honestly. I mean, there's um, there's drawing words and writing pictures by Jessica Rabel and Matt Madden, which is um, uh, a, a good textbook. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, do recall kind of color, uh, mentioning color. At, they uh, mention it, but I don't think there's even any specific examples or it's, it's 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 not a full color book for one thing no that's right it's only spot color isn't it yeah um, but I, i'm not sure if i can kind of think of um a specific chapter it's probably something that needs to be addressed <laughs> <laughs> well we just found our next challenge yeah, you know, I mean, I can't think of any offhand. I mean, I can think of there's some, uh, and I can't think of the names offhand, but like, the, you know, design books that approach this idea from a graphic designer's standpoint, which would probably be uh, interesting. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, it'll, it'll be something maybe we'll follow up on in a later episode because I'm sure we could easily fill another hour. I, you know, we're already coming up on the, the end of the, the show. I want to give the chat a chance. Everybody who's in the chat, if you have any questions you want to ask either of these guys, uh, we'll take a couple minutes to fire, let you fire off a few questions and let them respond. And then I just want to say, uh, give you guys a chance for final thoughts, uh, things you want to mention that you're going to be doing. Because, Jim, you're all over the map lately. You were in Brooklyn, like, what, two weeks ago, a week ago? I've been all over the map in the last couple of weeks. I'm mostly home now. So, oh, really? Uh, I, did a, I did an event in Lansing, Michigan last night, and I'm going to head out to Minneapolis next week, next Thursday, Friday. What's that for? Uh, the University of Minnesota is having me... Uh, I, f I found out this is a course, continuing education course, and I'll be talking comics with a physics professor named Jim Kakalios mm. uh, thir next Thursday night. Uh, but yeah, the big the big push for uh, F Feynman promotion is mostly done now. So my nine cities, fourteen days or something, uh, that's passed. the The dark circles are gone from underneath my eyes. I think. <laughs> Uh, but it was really quite, quite exciting uh, to do that. Another thing, just to just to keep on the Feynman thing, just for one more second, that Sharon brought up last week that I think is super cool is the notes in the back of the book, and that you you. I'm uh, a librarian by day. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, stop it. And, but there's a lot of one of the things I love about this book is that it's not only a metaphor for being a cartoonist and being somebody who is excited about a subject and just wanting to share that passion with the world. And I think the epilogue, when Feynman is confronting the notion of his own forthcoming demise, mm -hmm. uh, really addresses that very beautifully. But there's also this sense of, boy, are you excited about this subject now, about the, the, this guy and what his life represented and the, and the subjects that this guy was interested in? Here's a whole boatload of more follow-up. <laughs> Fifteen more pages <laughs> full of stuff you could read. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I love this idea of using this as a jumping-off point to get people more interested in the subject matter that you're interested in, too. I think that's really cool. Uh, so it's not just like a, a cold bibliography. It's like it's like a bunch of recommended reads. Well, the the, re the reason I read the books that I did was be 
because they were interesting and full of fun information. Uh, you know, I know I read at least two two books that uh, Nick recommended to me after after uh, finishing Leica. Uh, that's the power of a good story. And I'm not sure how much is in the bibliography or how much you just told me directly, <laughs> Nick. But oh, there's there's quite a few in here. Yeah. 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 There's a full bibliography and even video that you can check out internet resources at the end of Leica. So. Right. So um, I think in this sense, we're not behaving too differently from any other work of historical fiction or biography or anything like that in the sense that, A, it's intellectually honest to cite your sources, and B, uh, if we've done our jobs well, uh, you know, I, I will go to Leica, I will go to the back of the book and want to read a few more things because now I'm really interested in this character or that character. And, you know, again, because, because Nick is intellectually honest, it's like this isn't the whole story. In fact, this is, this is somewhat fictionalized. But you can learn more and see more in these other places. And that's, I mean, that's fun for me uh, to, A, get that from a book, and B, to do that in a book that I've done myself. Right, yeah. Any, any other uh, final things that you wanted to mention that you're do up to, Nick, besides the sketch blog? Um, oh, I, I, I'm working on a couple of new graphic novels, which um, so I'm sort of pretty much nose to grindstone on that. Um, I don't have any appearances coming up. I just made one at the New, new York Comic Con. Um, although I think, oh, hang on, I think there's something on Friday at the um, Tower <laughs> House Arena uh, where the um, nursery rhymes book for uh, the first second is going to be... Um, uh, going to be launched. Oh, that's right. Yes, the big nursery rhymes book signing. Uh, Dave Rowan and Raina Telgemeier are going to be there. Um, I'm trying to think who else is in the book. Uh, oh, jeez. Oh, I'm my goodness. Like Richard Thompson, Jules Pfeiffer, Thank Nick you. is in there. Uh, I just read it. Uh, gosh, there, there's... I can't even... I can't even remember how... Uh, Craig Thompson, oh uh, Lily, Lily Carré. Oh, gosh. It just goes on and on and on. So, yeah, it's a who's who. Jaime Hernandez. Oh, my gosh. Hernandez brothers are in there, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah uh, I, saw, uh, I, I saw a copy in our mutual editor's office, Callista, uh, when, when, I was, when I was there last week, and she, I said, oh, this looks beautiful. And she said, you know, if I looked away and you put that in your backpack, it would probably be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and amazingly enough, I get back here to Michigan, and there it is in my backpack. <laughs> All right. <laughs> How these things happen. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, apart from that, I'm pretty much nose to grindstone. I'm, I'm doing um, my next book for the first second, which is tentatively titled Skin Trouble at this point, which is, again, historical, but it's, um, it's based much more on anecdotal history because it's, uh, it's loosely based on the, um, uh, the story of my bad life and my wife's bad life, both of whom were immigrants to uh, the UK in the 1950s. Um, uh, my dad was Greek and Alexandrian Greek, um, and he came to uh, Britain to learn English. He didn't speak any English. And my wife's uh, uh, father was Jamaican, and he came uh, with that kind of whole Windrush generation. And um, it's about the, uh, the, the, the different kinds of uh, hurdles that they encountered in British life. And it comes right up to the kind of present day um, as well. And it's really about migrancy more than anything else. Economic oh. migrancy and uh, some of the sort of social situations that that throws up. So I'm, I'm, I'm working on that, and that's been a, a long time labor of love. Um, and I'm also working on a top secret project, which I'm hoping to announce sometime soon, uh, which is all to do um, with, uh, uh, well, let's just say, Orson Welles and Rita Hayworth make guest appearances. So, in a sense, that's historical. Huh. Yeah, I'll buy that book. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So if you want to know of upcoming books, I've also got another book from coming from First Second. This is probably one or two years away uh, mm -hmm. about Diane Fossey, Jane Goodall, and Baruti Galdikas, oh, about wow. the primate researchers. And then uh, with, and that's being illustrated by Maris Wicks mm. and a book about Alan Turing. Oh, okay. That's yeah. being uh, illustrated by Leland Purvis. Wow, and this is this is also the first second. Uh, the Turing story is going to be serialized uh, via Tor, 
the science fiction publisher, Tor.com. Okay, yeah. And then we're not sure what the, what the print thing is, how we're going to get it into print yet, but it'll happen. But hats off to you guys for both, you know, working with First Second, because I've said this before on the show, and I'll say it a million more times. They are, in my opinion, the Pixar of comics right now. Everything they're doing is stellar, and even if you're not interested in the subject matter, even if you don't care about what that book is about, you pick it up and you read it, and you're like, I'm glad I did that. Everything they put out is amazing, and I don't know how they do it. So you guys are in good company, uh, and yeah. yeah, hats off to you for getting this through. This is, this is a gorgeous book, Jim. Uh, they, they do really beautiful design work, I think. Colleen Venable uh, with her book and cover design. Did Colleen do yours as well, Nick? Uh, no, it was actually a collaboration between myself and uh, uh, Charlie Orr. I call oh, okay. The first second at that stage. Okay. Uh, but I'll, I'll second that. I think that Colleen's uh, an extraordinary designer. So yeah, they're both gorgeous books. They're they're terrific reads, and uh, they're from a great company. So there's there's my recommendation. And everybody's at library, either at, whether at home or public library, should be stocked with these books. So, and Eric's posting the links in the chats to the books. FirstSecondBooks.com is where you can find them. And great. then NickAbadzis.com or um, let's see, what was the the sketch blog? NickAbadzis.my-expressions.com. Yes. Correct. You're also on Twitter. I am. Uh, Nick Abadzis on Twitter, uh, Nick Abadzis on Google Plus, uh, good branding. And Facebook, yeah. And you can find me at all those spots. Uh, um, and if you just put in Nick Abadzis, you'll find it. It's, um, yeah, there's links at the, uh, the sketch blog as well. So if anybody's looking for those, they can just go to, the, go, go to nickabadzis.com, go to the blog, and there's uh, links down the side. And the sketch blog is gorgeous. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to find in my uh, reader every every time you update so yep. uh, people should subscribe to that so um and jim are you on you're on facebook i know but facebook google plus no uh -huh. twitter i don't i don't have anything i can i mean you, you, we just did uh, an hour long you've <laughs> is is it conceivable to you that i can say anything in 140 characters or less i'm eating a bag of chips <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're a man after my own heart <laughs> you, you could share all the mundane aspects of your life like i'm eating chips i'm done with the chips you know no, <laughs> you can't share meaningless stuff. Uh, <laughs> no, I do it all the time. I just don't. I, don't, I just don't broadcast it. <laughs> you save it for the people you love. That's right. <laughs> don't want to waste the world's time. Oh, you're a good man. Uh, but yes, yeah, so you can find you on Facebook gt-labs.com. Is there any other site that people should be looking for? Well, stuff on? on Facebook, it's Jim Ottaviani, okay. and on Google Plus, it's Jim Ottaviani. So I've I've done a poor job, unlike Nick, of of consolidating the brand but uh, <laughs> on, on the web it's gt-labs.com this is you know I started that in 1998 or something there was no uh, uh, Facebook Google Plus Twitter or anything like that it just seemed like yeah. a good idea to have a, a publishing company that didn't sound like a publishing company so <laughs> maybe that wasn't even a good idea but that's what it was and you go to GT Labs to see a picture of uh, an x-ray of Jim's head that's that's, that's right. the only about page that's been there for a long time so yeah. But, uh, okay, well, thank you guys so much for this awesome conversation. This was really, really fun for me, and I know it was fun for the listeners as well. So everybody who's listening, you should follow these guys in their respective social media sites. Go to their websites and check out their books. You won't, be, uh, you won't regret it. I hope to get you guys again sometime to talk more about this stuff when you have something else to promote or just if you want to sit around and talk about why comics are so wonderful. Yeah. Um, so, okay, well, thanks, guys, again. Thanks, for everybody. You're quite for welcome. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So uh, thanks, everybody, for listening and downloading. This is broadcast every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time at comicsgreat.tv, uh, and the podcast is available after the fact at comicsgreat.com. Until next time, everybody, I've been Jersey Drozd, uh, Jersey on the Twitters. Okay, bye. <laughs>